Well, this morning, we're continuing our series. The series is called Moses the Deliverer. And uh, two weeks ago, we saw God, uh, God's preservation. God preserved Moses uh, in a time when he should have been or was destined to be killed in a river. But God preserved him. God saved him from the river. Last week, we talked about God's preparation. God's preparation of Moses and how he had taken him into the house of Pharaoh. The same Pharaoh, mind you, who had destined him to destruction is now in this place where he is offering him life. But um, that was just phase one of his preparation. It would be a 40-year preparation phase, but today we're going to talk about phase two. So um, it's interesting how sometimes in our culture we expect everything to happen overnight. We expect instantaneous position and understanding and prominence. And uh, it was going to take Moses some time. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, would you turn with me to Exodus chapter 2? If you don't have a Bible, there should be a pew Bible there in front of you. And I would encourage you to go ahead and grab that and turn to page 56 in the pew Bible. We'll be, we'll be uh, starting in Exodus 2. Beginning at verse 11. Exodus 2, verse 11, it says, One day after Moses had grown up. Now, John Durham, he's a, a, a scholar who wrote a commentary, and uh, in his commentary, I like how he translated, translates this and from the Hebrew. He says, The days flew by. I don't know if you've had that experience in your own life when the days flew by. I think many parents can look back and say, How did my child get to be this age? Whether it's 7 or whether it's 17 or 27, I, I know my mom will often say, well, I know I'm old because now my children are old. And the days sometimes fly by. This is 40 years, the days fly by. And going on, it says, Moses went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. No, he watched them. And this is a word that occurs a number of times in Exodus chapter 2. You, you may remember some of them that uh, it's also translated saw. So Moses' mother saw that Pharaoh, or that Moses was a, a, a healthy child. Later, Pharaoh's daughter is said to have seen, to, she saw the baskets among the reeds. And then it says that she saw a child. And then in verse 11, later on in chapter 2, what it says is that Moses observed, Moses saw their hard labor, and he saw an Egyptian man attacking a Hebrew man. Each time someone saw something, it inevitably leads to action. They saw something, they did something. And Moses' mother saw the child, and she did something. She decided that she would take a basket and cover it in tar and put it in the river to preserve that child's life. Pharaoh's daughter saw the child and determined that she would take that child into their household and raise this child. And so as it comes to verse 11, when it says that Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, the anticipation builds. There's this expectation that something is going to happen because every time they saw something, the person did something. And so as it goes on in verse 11, it says that he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. And that should raise a question. It's easy to gloss over that and move right on and to say, well, of course they're talking about the Hebrews. But let me ask you this. Maybe they're talking about the Egyptian. Who are his own people? Moses, by blood, was a Hebrew. Moses, by experience, was an Egyptian. He had grown up in Pharaoh's court. His people, it may very well have been one of the brothers of another one of the wives who was living in Pharaoh's household who may have very well have been beating that Hebrew person. He may have seen that Hebrew person beating. And so where it says one of his own people, it may very well have been one of those he identified with as his, 
Egyptian family. Or perhaps he was looking at the Hebrew and saying, this is one of my people who is being beaten here. It's important to feel this tension in this place because Moses is having an identity crisis. He's come to this place where he's not really certain who he is. Sometimes as you become a Christian, there comes a place in your life where there's an identity crisis. Who will I identify with? In verse 12 going on, it says, Looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now if you take notice, it's the same word. Looking this way and that, he saw no one. He did take action again. He saw something or hoped that nobody would see anything. And he took action by burying an Egyptian in the sand. Now, every instance before, the action was a positive action. But in this case, Moses' action was impetuous. It was a spur of the moment. It was a murderous action. At very least, it was manslaughter. And... uh, These actions are a bit of a blemish, a bit of a scar, a bit of an embarrassment on what's otherwise a man of faith. You know, one of the things I've shared with you before, and I still think it's a very important thing, as an apologetic for why we believe that Scripture is true, are instances like this. It shows the blemishes, it shows the embarrassments about the biblical heroes. Because when you think in, say, Greek mythology, the heroes are often very whitewashed. They are idealistic, idolized. They are held on pedestals. But when you consider the biblical heroes, men men like Moses, who kills a man, Noah, who gets drunk, David, who commits adultery, These blemishes tell us that the people that we read about in the Bible are not idealized, but rather men, ordinary men and women like you and I, that God has used in some extraordinary ways. If the Bible were telling stories just like Homer's Odyssey, these people would be idealized and held up as role models, but the problem is you can never attain that level of perfection. But we look at the heroes and we say, if God can use somebody like that, then he can use somebody like me. God is able to take ordinary people and do extraordinary things. Again, going back, Moses, his mother saw his beauty and she saved the baby. But now Moses sees the abuse and he sees an opportunity. So he looks this way and he looks that way and believing that nobody sees him, he takes the life of the Egyptian. Now, at the risk of sounding like I'm trying to whitewash this incident, it is a possibility because the word where it's translated killed is the same word that it says that um, a little bit earlier that the the Egyptian was beating the Hebrew. It was a strike. Later, it would also be used of the two Hebrews who come against each other, that they were beating each other. It may very well be possible that Moses did not intend to kill the Egyptian. However, he did intend to do him some harm. So here on day one, Moses saw people burdened by slavery, and he took matters into his own hands. He saw a slave beaten by a taskmaster, and he saw an opportunity to deliver this victim. At verse 13, we come to day two. Verse 13, it says, the next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Again, There's that word. He saw. And because he saw, you expect an action. action. He sees another opportunity. And this time he sees the opportunity that he can impose himself into the situation and provide, again, a solution. 
We like to do that, don't we? We see a problem, we want to fix it. And Moses was in this very state of a little bit more impetuous than you and I, a little bit more uh, unguarded perhaps than sometimes we are, but he wanted to solve the this, this situation. So he sees it. But rather than receiving Moses, as he kind of assumed that the people would, the people, the Hebrew, that is, says, um, excuse me, who made you ruler and judge over us? Probably a teenager arguing here, right? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. And I can hear him thinking inside his head, "Uh uh-oh. Because he had looked this way, and he had looked that way, and what he had done was unknown. But it's been found out. And so they ask, who made you ruler and judge over us? And although it hasn't happened yet, although Moses hasn't come to the burning bush yet, God was preparing him for just that, to be the ruler and the judge. That he would be the one who would deliver the people, that would guide the people, that would provide for them God's law. But they hadn't seen that yet, and so they say, are you a ruler and judge? Little did they know. And so the Hebrew rejected him. Word had gotten out. This verse is pivotal in Moses' life because there's this place, remember, where he was in an identity crisis. And he was trying to figure out where he fit in. He was trying to find out how all of the, who, who he identified with, whether it was the Egyptians or whether it was the Hebrews. His mother had certainly spent some time in, the, in his growing up years. Although he had been raised by Pharaoh's daughter, his mother apparently had come from time to time to speak some of his history into his life. So he knew the story of the Hebrew people, and he knew the life of an Egyptian. And now he's wondering, who am I? And the Hebrews had rejected him. But he had killed an Egyptian, so he didn't fit in there any longer. So he was a man who was lost, a man without a home. In verse 15, it says, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. You're seeing this distance grow between who he thought he was and who God was making him to be. Pharaoh tried to kill him. But Moses fled and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. You see, the death penalty for what Moses had done, or the penalty for what Moses had done was the death penalty. It was expected that what he had done, Pharaoh would met out justice. And so... As some verses said, said, he fled from the presence of Pharaoh. He escaped his jurisdiction. He crossed the county line. And so he was outside of Pharaoh's presence. And there he would find safety in a land called Midian. He was out of his reach. And there, as he sat by the well, he sees something new. Now, that word isn't in that passage, but again, there's something new that he sees. Look at verse 16. Now, a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to the rescue and watered the flock. What does he see? A burdened people. What does he see? An abusive Taskmaster, shepherds. And what does he see? An opportunity. An opportunity to intervene again. And this time, though we have no record of Moses killing anyone, we do see that Moses comes to the rescue. 
He steps into the situation one more time. It's almost like he's wired for this, isn't it? There's this natural ability, there's this natural desire, there's this God-given strength that Moses has to be a deliverer. And that's what God often does in our lives. He doesn't call us to do things we're incapable of, but often things that he has been preparing us for all our lives. He uses fishermen to become fishers of men. He uses Moses, who's inclined to deliver, to eventually deliver his people. And how has God wired you for his purposes? There's a foreshadowing here of of what Moses would do. The great task still lied ahead when he would deliver God's people out of slavery in Egypt. But there is this trajectory his life is set on. And what is your trajectory? Going on in verse 18, it says, When the girls returned to Reuel, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water from us and watered the flocks. And the great question from the dad of these young women is like, Where is he? They got a little um, carried away in their excitement, didn't they? is that they couldn't believe what happened. And because they were so excited about what happened, they tore off and told their dad, leaving Moses behind at the well. So Raul asks, where is he? Why did you leave him? Invite him. Let's get him something to eat. It's the least we can do. Doesn't say that, but that's the idea, right? Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. And Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. You know, as we've seen already, time flies in this biblical narrative. We go from birth to 40 years later. And now in this brief instance, Moses saves the girls, he delivers them, and next thing you know, he's living with Raul, otherwise otherwise known as, um, the name just left me, Jethro. And so they're living there, and time passes, and he gets married, and they have a child, and the child's name is Gershom. Now in the NIV, if you're reading the NIV, the Pew Bible is a new international version, the NIV translation. Some of the other translations may translate this a little bit different. The NIV says, I've become a foreigner in a foreign land. And that leaves one to understand that what he is saying is, well, now that I'm here in Midian, what that means is Midian is the foreign land. But the more literal translation is, a stranger I have been, not a stranger I am. I am a stranger, I was a stranger in a foreign land is a better translation of that. What he's talking about is I had been a stranger in Egypt. For 40 years he had been in Egypt, but that was never his home. That was never where he belonged. And now he has found a place in Midian where he feels like he's at home. But why should that be a place where he feels at home? Midian was a child of Abraham. And at this point in the biblical narrative, there's a good relationship. They have not left the faith of Abraham. When God told Abraham that his descendants would be as many as the stars in the sky and the sands of the shore, the children of Midian were part of that promise. And at this point, these same people pursued the God of Abraham, the God of their fathers. So Moses, the man who was lost, is now feeling a little bit at home because he is reconnected with family. Distant relatives, mind you, but they were family. And they worshipped a familiar God, the God of Abraham. Picking up at verse 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help, because of their slavery, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites 
and was concerned about them. Verse 25 again, what's it say? So God looked. That word is the same word that we've seen again and again. God saw. God saw the Israelites. And what's that? Seeing expectation, it creates the expectation of doing, right? So here we are coming to the end of this chapter and we see God seeing and we expect God to be doing. And we'll pick up on that in the weeks to come. Because there's this pattern. Moses' mother saw, Moses' mother did. Pharaoh's daughter saw, Pharaoh's daughter did. Moses saw, Moses did. God saw, God will do. And that's what lies ahead in the chapters that will come. But for today, what we really see is this desire to come home. This desire to belong. And there is within each of us this desire to fit in, to belong, to be part of something. But before Moses could be the man that God wanted him to be, the, the man who would deliver God's people from Egypt, there would be 40 more years of preparation. For 40 years he spent in Pharaoh's house, 40 years he would spend in Midian. And so even though God saw the people, it would be 40 more years before God would begin to deliver. Sometimes we get very impatient with God, don't we? We expect that deliverance today. And we may not always see what God is doing, but God is moving the pieces as we pray and we call out to God for deliverance. God may be working in the background to prepare someone, to prepare the situation, to prepare you for what he has. God would continue to prepare Moses. Now, if you and I are going to lean into all that God has for us, what is God preparing us for? If we're going to lean into finding what God desires for us, there's some things that have to happen for us to begin to live out God's purpose for our life. And that first thing is that you have to realize that you're lost. Moses was quite comfortable in Egypt. All that life could afford was at his disposal. But he was lost. He had much that the world would be envious of, but he was lost. Sometimes you don't realize you're made for another world. You don't realize that you belong somewhere else. The first thing we have to realize is we are not made for this world. We are made for another world. God did not create us for this moment, but God created us for eternity. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes judgment. It says to be present from the, or to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We are created to be in God's presence. And we will be in, pres in the presence of God on that day that you die have you ha if you have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But there's something even greater. God will return and he will usher in his new heaven and new earth. God has created, for, created us for eternity. And we get lost in this moment where we live for today in all of its trappings. Egypt was not Moses' home. He was made for something more, and he was made for another place. Perhaps you've been immersed by the world around you. You're in so deep that you don't even know that you don't belong. This culture is quick to conform us to its pattern. But what does it say in Romans 12? To do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's so easy to let the world shape you to become like it. But we are called to be a part of God's world. That's why in Colossians, Paul writes, Do not set your things on things, or set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. Our perspective needs to be eternal, it needs to be heavenly, it needs to be God directed. This world is not all there is. And apart from God, you're lost in need of a Savior. 
So let me ask you, have you come to the place in your spiritual life, if you were to die today, that you know for certain you would go to heaven when you died? The Bible says that these things have been written so that you may know for certain that you have eternal life. Do you know for certain that you have eternal life? The first thing you need to do is admit that you're lost if you have not come to that place. I alluded to this earlier this morning as that connection card. Let me remind you again. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's a place on there that says, I would like more information about becoming a follower of Jesus. That's you today. Check that box before you turn it in so that we can follow up with you and help you know for certain that if you were to die today that you would have eternal life. Moses had to separate himself from Egypt. We have to separate ourselves from the things of this world. Instead, pursue the things above. Second thing you have to do is surround yourself in Christian community. If you want to lean into God's purpose for your life, you don't do it alone. And you can't do it by leaning into the world. You need to lean into God's community. Moses found his direction and his purpose having reconnected to the Midians, people who share, shared the faith of his fathers. We need to lean into the community. The Bible tells us time and time again the, the, the advantages of being part of a Christian community. In the Christian community, you are to love one another, to be devoted to one another, to live in harmony with one another, to encourage one another, serve one another, to fellowship with one another, to build one another up. Proverbs tells us, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We sharpen one another. As we discover Christian community and we lean into that, we lean into God's purpose and, and help find our place in this world and what God has for us. And God uses that to prepare us for his purposes of what we will do for his kingdom. So surround yourself in Christian community. Third, serve God in the little things. John the Baptist once said, as he saw Jesus, he says that he must increase and I must decrease. Moses had been in the palace, and now he's in the pasture. Sometimes we want the glory without the work. But God had to take Moses to the pasture for 40 years to prepare him for ministry. If you want to do great things in life, learn how to clean a toilet. If you can't clean a toilet, you can't be a CEO. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, the first thing we read is, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro. It wasn't going to be through Moses' stellar education that he received through Egypt. It wasn't going to be because he had been prepared to be a statesman, but it was because God had continued to pre pre prepare him as a shepherd, that he would be able to shepherd the flock of Israel in the wilderness. Jesus tells us in Luke 16.10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. You see, sometimes God gives us little things to see if we're faithful in the little things, then we will be faithful in much. Jesus goes on, and whoever, whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. See, God gives us little things to prepare us for big things. Moses was faithful in the little and would later be entrusted with more than I think he could ever have imagined. So often we desire to be put in these positions of prominence, but we're not willing to do the things that nobody sees. To pick up, to clean up, to fix something without anybody ever noticing. Moses spent 40 years in relative obscurity in the pasture before God put him in a position of leadership. Moses had been lost in Egypt for 40 years, a foreigner in a foreign land. And now he returns to people who worship the same God. He reconnects to his purpose through that. And Midian still wasn't his home. God would eventually tell him that he would lead people into the promised land. Apart from Christ, we are lost in need of a Savior. 
And Jesus said, I come to seek and save the lost. Your sins have separated you from God. If you don't know Jesus, you are separated from God. You are lost. But God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to bring us back into relationship with him. And when you become a follower of Jesus, he invites you to become part of his family. And each person has a role, a purpose to fill. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit has given us gifts. He is apportioned as according to the need of the church. He's given us each a purpose and a gift. He has wired you with your strengths, your skills, your abilities, and spiritual gifts that you would be part of God's kingdom purposes. Some of you are wired to care for little children in the nursery. Talk about one of the most, one of the places of greatest, like nobody notices, unless you're the parent of that child that is able to drop the child off into your care. Let me encourage you, if God has wired you to care for children, to sign up in our nursery. Some of you, God has wired to be teachers, and people have affirmed that gift in your lives. And if that's you, let me encourage you. On this card, again, there are opportunities for service. If, there's, if it's not listed here, something you're interested in, put it on the back and let us know. There are places for you to serve, not to serve the purposes of our Savior's Baptist Church, but to serve the purposes of God, God's kingdom because God has wired you and God has put you in a place and God gives gifts to the body for the glorification of God. And he does that through his people in this context. And so you are here for a purpose. Let me encourage you to find that purpose. Maybe you have the gift of helps, and you just like to help people. You like to serve people. Maybe you have the gift of intercession. You like to pray for people. Join us in prayer on Wednesday nights and pray with us or pray in the quiet of your own home. But pray. Maybe God has given you the gift of evangelism. Let, let me encourage you to get out there and do evangelism. Maybe God has given you fill in the blank. You have a gift that God has given you, strengths, abilities, talents that God has wired you with for his purposes that you might be part of his kingdom movement. This world, again, isn't all there is. And we are reminded that one day Jesus will return and establish his heaven and earth, bring it to this place and a new reality for us. That Jesus will descend upon the clouds and all those who have received him will meet him in the air. And that then he will destroy the earth and build a new heaven and earth. And there we will live for, with him for eternity. And that's when we will truly find ourselves at home. And there should be this longing in your heart even today that says, God, I long for you. And there's more than this world has to offer. offer. This world should not be your satisfaction because you will not, you will not be satisfied until you meet Christ and Christ returns to establish our world, a new heaven and a new earth for eternity. And in the meantime, God has called us to be part of his deliverance purpose here on earth, to deliver people from bondage to sin. He says, go and make disciples of all the earth. God has called us to be part of that process that delivers people from bondage to sin until that day that he returns. Don't lose yourself in this world, but find yourself in God's purposes, living for the world to come. Let's pray. Lord, this world is not all there is. And I pray for a holy discontentment that we would be aware of this longing within us for eternity. I pray for those today that may not know you, that today might be the day of their salvation, that they would receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. For those of us who know Jesus, I pray that we would live on purpose for the kingdom, with our eyes set on eternity, that we might be part of your purposes here on earth, to deliver the message of deliverance from bondage to sin and liberty in Jesus 
that we might live for the promised land, the true promised land, which is the new heaven and the new earth and the world to come. Keep our eyes on him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.